What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. Now, look, for those of y'all who are new here, the purpose of Living Corporate is to create a space that affirms black and brown experiences in the workplace. Right. There are certain things that only we can really understand. And when I say we, I mean the collective non-white professional <laughs> in corporate America. Um, and when we look around, if you like Google being black and brown in corporate America, you may see like a post I'm um, in Huffington Post or something that kind of communicates from a position of lack. But I don't know if we necessarily see a lot of content that empowers and affirms our identity and our experience. And that's really the whole purpose of Living Corporate. It's with that that I'm really excited to talk to you all about the See It To Be It series. Amy C. Wanniger, um, who has been a guest on the show, who's a writer for Living Corporate and who's also the author of Network Beyond Bias. Um, she's actually partnered with Living Corporate to actually have an interviewing series where she actually sits down with black and brown professionals so that we can learn about what they actually do and see ourselves in these roles, right? So it's a variety of industries that she's, she's talking to a lot of different types of folks. You're gonna be able to see what they do. And at the same time, you're gonna hopefully be able to envision yourself in that role, hence the title, See It To Be It, okay? So check this out. The next thing you're gonna hear is this interview with Amy C. Wanniger. Y'all hang tight, catch y'all next time, peace. Cassandra Dacent is a certified project management professional and the founder and CEO of Bridge Tech Enterprises. Leveraging her 10 plus years of experience in STEM specific roles with leading conglomerates, Cassandra is focused on executing project mandates and assisting companies who are intent on helping their technical teams and project managers thrive in their careers and be at the forefront of the development and delivery of innovative products and solutions. Please welcome to the show, Cassandra Dacent. Cassandra, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm well, Amy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Now, can you tell me what you do as a technical project manager? Sure. So I handle not only the organizational requirements of a project, meaning scheduling, resources, budgets, equipment, um, and managing a project from start to finish, but as a technical project manager, I often uh, work with developers, engineers um, who speak a different language, literally. So I am the hybrid project manager, if you will, being able to disseminate requirements that are technical in nature to the business and users in a way, in a language that they will be quickly able to adapt and understand. And do you focus your work on any particular industry or do you work across all industries? Um, I work primarily in the supply chain and STEM industries. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And so how did you get involved in, first of all, in project management? What was your path to this role? Really interesting um, because I am I don't have a degree in computer sci. Um, I actually didn't graduate from university. I studied music and psychology. So how I ended up leapfrogging my way into STEM career was I was working at a, a company many years ago and I was working as a credit analyst at the time. I was in finance and I wanted to shift gears. I knew that the tech, you know, the tech industry was well paying diverse opportunities, but I didn't quite know how to unlock it. Um, and fortunately, uh, a series of circumstances resulted in a position opening up at the company I was at, and it was for a technical position in EDI, which stands for Electronic Data Interchange. And nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted to go near it because they didn't understand it. They, most people weren't interested in, in a technical position. And I saw that if I was able to land it, that could really open doors for me. So I talked with my, my director and she was like, okay, let's try this. So I said, send me to a boot camp. Let's start with that. And if I'm able to, you know, latch onto that and grasp that, let's just run with that. So she's, and I was working in Canada at the time in Montreal. So I attended a boot camp at uh, Sol in Solon, Ohio. And this was back in 2009. And I came back, I learned basically how to create mappings, you know, coding, develop an EDI subset, came back and just jumped to it, you know, and just, it was sink or swim. And fortunately, you know, I was able to really make a good career out of that. And from there, I started to manage implementations. 
and projects for EDI as, a, as part of my role. So that's how I fell into project management, so to speak. And that was, you know, as I said, from 2009 onward, and I eventually became a certified project manager and scrum master, and I held positions in engineering and software development since then. I love this story because you are the exception to the rule, right? So data tells us that most men will apply to a role if they think they've got, you know, what, 50, 40%. If so much, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I'm thinking even maybe not even ten. Like yeah, I always bold. Yeah, I joke that if if men can read the job description and understand most of the words, they'll apply, right? I'm blown away by this and I want to put a focus on this for anybody who's listening. So you came to this role without a technical background, without a college degree in this field, and what you said was, I'll give it a try. I can learn anything. Basically put me in, coach. And you got the opportunity. Yeah. So it required getting someone to, to vouch for me, to stand with me, to be an advocate. That was extremely crucial. If I didn't have my director going to bat for me with the SVP of the company, I wouldn't be here in my career 10 plus years later thriving. Right. So that was essential. The other ingredient was I was bold. I was bold enough to say, this is what I want. Here's what I'm willing to do in order to guarantee this result, right? I was willing to put myself in a zone of complete discomfort in a world that I didn't know, I had no bearings in, but I just had enough self-possessedness to just say, let me try. The worst is what can happen. I just go back to finance. Okay, that's really not the worst that can happen to me, right? But looking back now, I'm like, that's, that is risky. That is for women, especially a woman of color. Um, and I was the only woman of color in my company at that time. So I really, in a way I look back, yeah, I broke several barriers at once, you know? Yeah. You did. So you mentioned having an advocate and the role that that vice president played for you. Can you tell me a little bit about how you started that relationship? There, there are folks and I'm one of them um, or at least I had been in the past, where I would get very um, intimidated by people's titles or by their stature in a company, and I wouldn't know how to approach those relationships. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you did that? Because laying the groundwork very early and building those relationships, as you said, can completely change the trajectory of where Absolutely. we're headed in our careers. I managed to do it by proving my worth through the quality of my work. So I let my work speak for itself. So they trusted me to perform. That's, you know, that's really one of the key ingredients to start a, an honest relationship with, um, with a manager or a senior or someone in the executive level is to, to demonstrate consistently that you are performing. And by extension, you care about the company because you are concerned about your personal output, right? You, you create that, that relationship. So, and then, and also I was able to, um, be comfortable in my successes as, as a finance person or as an EDI person. And that also gave me the confidence to sometimes question decisions, but obviously in a way that was respectful. Um, and respectable of both of our positions, I, I never took it for granted that, okay, I'm building this relationship with these people, but I respect your, I respect where you're at, just as how, because of the, 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 the quality of my work, they could respect where I'm at as well. So it, 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 it shifted over time where it will, let's be honest, you know, you're looking at it from an SVP and someone who is an individual performer. Many people would look at that as very hierarchical, but when trust is built, it starts to like invariably even out because you start to look at each other as people first before the titles. So that takes time and it's a cycle, but you have to prove yourself as a performer before they're going to be able to say, okay, uh, she or he, they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. Let me be more open to them with other ideas. Fantastic. And so you mentioned that you focus a lot on supply chain and I'm guessing, so for people who don't understand what EDI is, 
Well, you explain it because you'll explain it better than I will. <laughs> sure. In its simplest form, it's the way we transfer information from one to another, from one entity to another. So, for example, you go shop at Macy's today, you buy your t shirt, you come home and you're happy. But have you ever stopped to think, well, how did that t shirt make it to the store? Right. So, it's as simple as um, one company, you know, the, the, the supplier, right, will say, okay, I, I have a hundred t-shirts available to sell to Macy's. Macy's will say, okay, I'm going to buy that 100 t-shirts. So I'm going to submit a purchase order to the other company to say, I want that inventory. Then the other company will respond electronically by saying, we can confirm your hundred t-shirts. Here is a shipping notification to let you know that the product has left our DC shipping to your DC and you know, so on and so forth, all the way down to invoicing. And EDI, it affects every aspect of our life from healthcare to technology to retail. It, every type of business runs with EDI. So it's how businesses talk to each other when they transact business. Right. So an EDI, it's in different forms. You can have it as XML. You can have it as um, API. Um, there's different languages, different methods of conveying data, but it's done electronically. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And so when you went from finance into supply chain, it was because you were proficient, I'm guessing, in EDI, which is sort of this universal language of how businesses work behind the scenes, right? So so fortunately, the company I was working with, and I can name them, um, they're a um, multi-billion dollar company, Oakley, the sunglass company. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I had worked with them for almost 11 years and they are not only a manufacturer, but they are also suppliers. So they run the entire spectrum of what we call supply chain, right? Um, so, you know, that's where I started my EDI career and then moved on to, I worked in EDI in insurance for a little while. Then I completely stepped up and became a software engineer level three and a software project manager uh, in the software development team for the last like three, four years. Yeah. That's great. And so what surprised you about this work that you did not anticipate when you said, send me to class and I'll figure this out? Wow. Um, so much, but um, that it's continuous learning. It's, it's, it's a field that you can't just sit on your laurels. And if you're going for your certification and you get, you, you know, you get your PMP or your CSM or whatever designation that you go for as a project manager that you should just sit back and say, okay, I, I've done it. I've reached this, the peak because our world is constantly shifting and innovating and, and it's, it's faster than almost the speed of light. We, it's our responsibility to keep up with new trends, to be able to manage projects more quickly, to be more adept, more agile. Um, more, you know, technically focused. So there's continuous learning that has to happen. And, at, you know, from the beginning, I had the misconception that it was like a one and done time thing. I've learned the, I've learned the fundamentals. I should be good. No, because we're constantly changing in the business world. So that's a huge shift um, that I picked on. Fortunately, pretty quickly, I realized that, okay, if I want to stay committed in this career, I have to commit to learning continuously. And that's something that I do to this day. Um, Another thing was how few of us there are still. Um, and I mean by few of us, meaning people of color, um, blacks, browns. And, you know, like I said, I, I have, more often than not, I'm usually the first or the few of in a department. You know, at my last job before my, my present one, I was the only um, lead software engineer female of color across the country in like software development for that company. And when I realized that I had to take a deep breath and say, okay, this is why it's hard. You know, this is why negotiating relationships with people is harder than it should be and harder than it feels, you know? Um, so there's still a long ways to go in every aspect of our culture and society, but, um, in project management, the beauty of project management is that there are almost, I think, a million professionals around the world. There's a lot of us. That's also something I didn't realize, you know, is that there's a huge community worldwide. So maybe within my company, I might be the only one, but I'm not in, in the grand scheme of the world. And, and through um, professional memberships, I've come to connect with other members who look like me and, and who have gone through similar journeys. Like, for example, um, the chapter of PMI 
in the Caribbean is hosted in my host country of Trinidad, you know? So, you know, you, you, you live and learn, but there's definitely challenges that I still confront on a daily basis. And it's mainly due to uh, human interaction, not necessarily from a professional standpoint. Yeah, I think most of us would say like people are the are the most difficult part of our job in some way or another, but I can't imagine how exacerbated that is, you know, when you're the only or one of very few in an entire company. And so you mentioned PMI. And so how did you get involved with that organization? Was that something that you, you know, sort of organically found? How did you find them? So um, a few years ago, I've been a member since September 2015, and I did a search online because I realized I'm like, there has to be a greater community, you know, that supports in terms of information. And I just made a decision that I wanted to pursue certification. So I went online and it's, it's a wealth of information. It's one of the most robust sites I've, I've seen, um, period. Um, and they host annual conferences and also um, like smaller events to not only help you qualify for um, your recertification, because as a project manager, once you pass that exam, which many consider the second hardest exam after the bar exam, it's very difficult to pass. Um, so once you've passed it, you, you, in order to keep that certification, you have to earn 60 PDUs, which are professional development units. Um, and you've got three years to, to earn that. So it's a cyclical three year period. Um, so that site is, a, really not only provides, um, reading material, there is a podcast that they offer. So there's a great wealth of information. And there's another sister site called projectmanagement.com. Um, that offers free webinars to those who are members and those who are not. So if you're looking or if anybody's looking to pursue a career in project management and is considering certification, those two sites are the premier sites that you would want to, to visit and, and get a good grasp on what they're doing for the project management community at large. And do you attend local meetings as well to find community or is it more of an online relationship with other people? Oh, absolutely. So there are chapters in every state and in several cities in every state. In Jacksonville, we have one of the larger chapter members. I think we're over a thousand members in, in Jacksonville alone. So you definitely want to join the local communities because it's, it's not only for networking opportunities, you can potentially get your next job by, you know, connecting with that person who's working at your, you know, your top five, you know, dream company. And the, find your way into your next career or your next job. And, and there's a lot of interns that pass through that you might become mentors to. Our, the senior project managers may mentor juniors as well. And uh, especially if you're studying for the exam, they hold a lot of local study groups to, to help you prepare adequately to pass that exam. Because as I said, it's difficult, very difficult <laughs> exam. It is, there's so much to it. Yes. I looked into now it. Now they're changing it. Um, and I decided they're coming out with a new edition. Yeah, so. <laughs> Very good. And I love that they have you, can, you know, the continuing education component of that, I think ties back into what you said about what surprised you about the work. And I love that they have, you know, they've codified that and said, look, as a standard of professionalism, you have yeah, to keep it, learning because everything is going to change. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a great system. Um, I, I think in terms of um, associations and membership, it's one of the, the premier ones that exist in the world. So. And so can you tell us just a little bit about if somebody's thinking about project management as a career, what are the characteristics or the traits or the knowledge that would be a good foundation for someone to have if they're wanting to explore this work? So one of the things I often tell people when they ask me that is you want to approach it in a very holistic manner. So it's, it's not only important for the individual to be organized and to be detailed and, you know, to, to keep people and, and, and events on track. It's about being willing to stretch yourself from a technical aspect. You know, you may not necessarily be strong from a technical aspect, but in order to be able to communicate with all the members of your team, you don't need to learn how to cope but you do need to understand the way they approach their work so that respect is gained, right? So that you have a better relationship and that it's easier for you to, let's say, ask a team member to work an extra two hours because you're behind on a certain task, right? Um, on the other hand, 
emotional intelligence is absolutely a crucial skill as a project manager to first be self-aware to understand what is going on with you what skills or attitudes or aptitudes you may be lacking and that you're willing to correct that in benefit of your career and the success of projects and then on the other side is being listen and acknowledge when your team members or stakeholders are pressuring you understanding that it's often not you they're dealing with other issues that are you know just exacerbating their reactions to you know to you so being mindful and being wise enough to we say in french faire la part des choses to be able to discern what's really happening as opposed to what the smoke screen is um understand that you will be dealing with people at all levels you'll be dealing not only internally you've got clients that are internal internal clients and external right so you, you you've got to be someone who's willing to absorb a lot of other people's energy and attitudes and um you've got to be strong you know because you're going to be challenged a lot in this career it's it's wonderful because you get to deal with so many interesting projects um sometimes you're at the forefront of innovation you know i i i've, I've been fortunate especially in the software world you really get to see where and even healthcare the types of projects that are being taken on are amazing you know and actually across every industry so there's a lot of room to grow there's a lot of variety but i won't lie and say there isn't stress and it's it's a career that you need to be able to manage that very well it sounds like you have a lot more um you have to lead more through influence than through authority in this Absolutely. role. Absolutely. In the agile world it's called servant leadership. So you're there to serve. You're there you're making yourself available to others and trying to meet their needs so that the needs the overall needs of the project are met. So it's not about you first and foremost, it's about the wellness and and the the well-being of everybody that's implicated in this mission or this project. And I would imagine that being an inclusive leader is very important in this space because you are dealing with so many different learning styles, work styles, personality types, people from different educational backgrounds, different demographic backgrounds, people with, you know, stakeholders with wildly different needs, assumptions, um motivations and <laughs> And yeah, they're one one person's priority is not the other person's um yeah, so you're doing competing interests. Um and it's uh it's something that as I said before, if you don't have the mental fortitude to understand that um it's a lot of emotional psychology that you're dealing with without realizing it, you know? Um and this is why the continuous learning part is is not only from a project manager standpoint from, you know, not only the technical application of being a project manager but also the human aspect of things how to deal with human nature and that's i also encourage people to read books or listen to podcasts that deal with you know mental well-being psychology um you know leadership all of the other soft skills if you will to strengthen you as a project manager so that it helps you in your day-to-day -day interactions with the host and the variety of people that you will come across and like i said you know some people are just difficult by nature um you know for whatever reason that is whatever is is kind of motivating them to behave that way you're not going to win over everyone what you can the goal is is to be respected you know at the end of the day is that you want to ensure that as a project manager you are respected by your team you're respected by the stakeholders they they see and acknowledge that the quality of your work supersedes anything else they may think about you and that's what matters at the end of the day is that you should be respected in the role that you have so you have when we were talking before we started recording you were telling me an interesting story about how you've taken this work that you have grown into over your career as a project manager and you come full circle now back to the financial world um with a client and a passion project can you tell us a little bit about that sure so i've been uh in the personal finance industry for 7 plus years now and um what i mean by personal finance is you know 
teaching people as a certified financial educator instructor, education instructor, I have taught people not only how to, you know, look at budgeting and saving and spending, but really live life in a more holistically healthy and wealthy manner. So to not only look at money as just a currency by itself, but consider that your mental well-being is a form of currency, your physical wellness is currency, your spiritual wellness is a form of currency. And those, you know, combined will just help you make better financial decisions when you're feeling better about your health, you know, and, and so forth. So how that now translates into project management is that I also have a company called Bridge Tech Enterprises and the CEO of that company. And so one of my clients is a nonprofit foundation by the name of Plutus Foundation. And they are a, they provide literacy um, education to uh, un, per, all communities, but especially to underserved communities. And they also celebrate those who are in the personal financial space and financial media um, for the work that they're doing with their communities. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to, to gift my skills and my aptitudes as a project manager to help others, you know, in the space that I also live in. So it, it, it really did come for full circle and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And you mentioned intergenerational wealth as a big issue that you're, that you're concerned about, um, especially in communities of color. And can you talk just a little bit about that and what that means? So from one, from one lens, it's, it's, I can talk about it as those of us who are in corporate, um, those of us who have salaries or earning income, what can we do to better make use of the money that flows into our lives? So, you know, I come from a, a single parent home and I'm a double immigrant. I was born in Trinidad. I was raised in Montreal and then moved to the United States later in life. And, you know, we struggled for a really long time because it was a very low income household. Um, and from looking back from that experience, I knew that I, I, I didn't want to end up that way when I was in my 60s, you know, worried about money or, you know, having a lower pension. So I made a commitment to changing my family, you know, fortunes, if you will, and hopefully leaving enough legacy to pass on to my stepson or whoever that they can also continue that generational wealth. There, that's one aspect, right? So I have to be mindful of the money that I'm making today because it, it can significantly impact my family, not only tomorrow, but for years to come. So that's a responsibility that I have taken to heart. Then there's the other aspect where, you know, for those of us who are entrepreneurs, small business owners, um, you know, we have an opportunity to change the, the, the financial situation. There's, I think there's several articles that says that, you know, the wealth of black people will be essentially $0 by 2052, right? Um, even if that's not necessarily the case, let's be realistic that, the huge gap in wealth that exists today is is unimaginable. You know, we we have over 400 years of catch up to make, okay? And we need everybody on deck to say, you know, how can we do better with our money so that black culture and the, the black race, so to speak, becomes wealthy, can, you know, you know, run multi-billion dollar corporations and it, it becomes the norm for us. We're not a one-off, we're not, you know, just a Robert Smith or, or, you know, an Oprah. We need more of us to become billionaires because th on that level, we can enact severe and, and massive change in, in the way that we live so that around the world, we're all benefiting from wealth. There's also in the black community, this notion of almost, I don't know what the right term is, but almost reverse generational wealth flow right? Where if you're the first one in your family to make it, now you feel an obligation to support your mom, your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents. And right. so it makes it even harder than to build wealth for the future, right? For yeah. your children and grandchildren, because you're now carrying the... I call it the golden child syndrome. <laughs> okay. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I don't want it to be confused with the black tax. So a lot of people confuse this particular situation with what's called the black tax, and it's not the black tax. The black tax, to clarify, is the, um, the effects of black people um, 
system systemically being oppressed through government policies through um corporate policies so that's a very separate issue at, which still affects us to this day so what i call the golden child scenario is exactly what you described amy where um there's one child in the family i'm a perfect example of the golden child that you know either has gone to college, the first to graduate from college, the first to make six figures, the first to be doing well financially. And there's this expectation, you know, whether spoken or unspoken, that they are now responsible for pulling the family up. Okay. As, uh, it happens a lot with blacks, especially immigrants. And it, there's so much emotional guilt wrapped up into that. Um, I support my mother-in-law and I support my mother to a large degree. They're both elderly, right? I have a stepson, so sandwich generation. I've got pressures from both sides of the equation. So how do you deal with that? Not only from an emotional perspective, but from your pocketbook, because is it to the point, to the detriment where you are now lacking because you are essentially helping to fund other people's households? And yeah, you may, you may be making six figures, but when you tally up the budget, you're not seeing much of your paycheck at, at the end of it. So that also we need to start looking at how to have conversations about money to really establish boundaries, expectations. So, and they're not easy conversations to have. Sometimes it, it gets so bad that you need to separate yourself from certain loved ones because it, the, the relationship becomes financially abusive. So there's many, many, many different elements to this conversation, but I'm glad you brought it up because it is something that a lot of us do struggle with. You know, I, the burden of that, and, and I don't mean, I don't mean the word burden in a negative sense, right? Just the, the emotional weight, the financial weight of that, the mental stress that would come with that um, is just, it, it, that's just gotta be huge. You know, I've, I've been in a position, I didn't grow up wealthy by any means, but you know, my parents were, um, you know, middle class. My mom did eventually graduate from college. She was a teacher for a number of years. And, you know, I jokingly refer to the first national bank of mom and dad, because I know if like, if everything fell apart tomorrow, I would have something, someone that I could, you know, borrow enough money to make it to next month. Right? Like that's something yeah. that I, that's a privilege that I have that I recognize. And to think that that's, that's not a shared experience in every culture, much less every family is, and I don't mean to say this like, a, a, oh my gosh, I'm, I come from such a privileged background, but in many ways I do. Right. And I think it's, I think it's hard for, so for example, for your white coworkers where you're the only black woman in, you know, a hundred or several hundred employees right and they're like well why can't you go out with us on friday why can't you go right to well we're all you know we're all going to go out for a nice steak dinner on on friday to celebrate the end of this project but or another one i've heard is where your boss will say well yeah we need you to travel just put it on your credit card and we'll reimburse you not realizing that yeah. not everybody had not everybody is born into good credit and co-signers and backstops and and any kind of you know i mean i didn't have a tremendous amount of financial literacy when i when i became an adult but i i had enough cushion to figure it out right because i had people i could rely on the point i'm trying to make is i think a lot of white co-workers will make erroneous assumptions and not realize they're doing it about the financial freedom that comes with having a good paying job, not realizing that that's not financial freedom for everybody. Now you've just got three generations worth of obligation. Absolutely. The most of them really don't understand the playing field is still not level. Even if you and I, you know, you're a white person and I'm not, we we're, we're both earning a hundred thousand dollars. You have no idea where that money is going for me at home because first of all, are, do we really connect with our coworkers on that level that we can have those private conversations so that you know that, okay, Cassandra not only has to take care of herself, she's got a husband, she's got a son, she's got two aging mothers, one lives in another country. So whereas vacation time where you can go and sit on a beach for a week at a five-star resort, my vacation time is spent every quarter schlepping back to Montreal to oversee 
my mother's care. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really about, do we really know each other first and foremost, right? Do we really care to ask questions and say, well, you know, if we're talking about supporting elderly mothers, for example, and well, someone will say, well, why don't you, you know, just have their pension and put them in a home. And I'm like, yo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that's a loaded question for those mentally people of color because we, many of us were raised to say, we don't put our elderly in a home, you know, although it may, not, it may actually be the best thing for them, but that's just a cultural shift that we need to have more conversations around where there's a better understanding of, we have very, very, market differences in how our money is spent so it's not just the assumption that people of color oh we we're all about the flash and we just want you know expensive things no a lot of us it's really about making sure we're okay making sure our family is okay um making sure like you said that's a great example about you know a company you know assuming that i can pull out my platinum credit card and pay for you know corporate expenses and then wait four weeks and have to beg you to get reimbursed, right? That's an expectation that should not be placed on us, period. But it is, you know? And it's little microaggressions like this that they don't understand that it could have such a ramification on, our, on us financially. And then no wonder we're working with gaps because you have these instances and so many, that replicates itself in so many different ways that we're always playing, you know, 10 steps back. It's hard. It's hard. It is. And, you know, add to that student loan debt, which if you didn't have parents of means, you did not, you know, you didn't get the, the mom and dad scholarship to college. You know, I had student loan debt for years and years and years. And a lot of people I worked with didn't understand that because they had come from families that were well off. And, you know, half of my paycheck every week is going to, you know, pay student loans and, you know, why don't you have this yet? Well, because I'm paying for school and right. Right. There's, so it just, know, it just multiplies. It just multiplies. Another one, immigrants who come to the country later in life, they have a shorter window of time to pay into social security in order to get basic social security, to get a decent check. You need to work 35 years. Every year you didn't work in those 35 years, they counted as zero. And that counts again against the amount that's calculated. What if you are not fortunate enough to have a white collar job, a professional job, you're sitting in an office every day, you're working hard labor, whether you're, uh, you know, a housekeeper, whether you're a garbage pickup person, whatever that, uh, you know, construction, your amount of time in the workforce is going to be shortened because of physical disabilities. The likelihood of you having to retire earlier is greater because of the physical stress that's put on your body. Then again, you don't have that amount of time to you know, put in a 401k. Most black people don't have access to a 401k period. So again, another disadvantage that is tied to, it's tied to a job as opposed to in Canada, you don't need a job to open a, four, a, a, a RSP. You can just go to the bank and open your RSP, which is the equivalent of a 401k. So it's not tied to a job. It's just tied to income in general. So as I said, systemic, this is like, a, I consider a black tax in a way because this is systemically created a disadvantage that's systemically created. So absolutely. And then add to the, if have, sorry, if you have a disability, you can only have so much money in savings. Yes. 2000, I believe is the number. Your disability benefits are cut. So when they say people, you know, Oh, you know, have enough for an emergency, have six months of income in the bank. If you have a disability and you're relying on, on disability insurance to help support you. Yeah you can't have that money saved legally or you lose your benefits. And that was right. something I didn't realize for a long time. So the harder we work, the more like physically, the harder we work, the more likely that is to happen. And Absolutely. now you've just taken, you've taken any opportunity away from wealth. This is such a fascinating conversation, Cassandra. I am, <laughs> oh my gosh, I could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> so just real quick to sum up, mm -hmm. um, where do you recommend people go for more information? Number one about, um, becoming a project manager, but number two about securing their wealth for themselves and for future generations. Sure. So I mentioned before uh, two sites. One's called projectmanagement.com and the other one is pmi.org. Um, if you are a person of color, 
I've started to kind of look look up groups before I, I joined you today. And there's one that I found, um, if you go on, anybody goes on meetup.com, there's some great local resources and groups that are available to you. But if you happen to live in Atlanta, there's one in particular that's called uh, the International Society of Black Project Managers. And they meet, I think, once a month or something like that. So if you're fortunate enough to live in the black Mecca of the United States, you know, um, avail yourself of, of that community because it's so important to not only join you know communities for your professional development but to be able to talk to people uh, who are, are living similar experiences so that you know you just feel like they're you're not alone in this it's really really important um and from a financial perspective there's so many awesome sites if you're looking um uh, from people of color who are doing amazing work there's tanya rapley there is uh, Tiffany Aliche, who is called the Budget Nista. Um, there's Sandy Smith. She leads an online community called Elevate, uh, which is a community of financial influencers that I'm a part of as well. And there's a, a conference actually that's happening in Washington, D.C., the second conference for that. So also the PlutusFoundation.org, you will find a list of different um, financial influencers that you can connect with and, and see which one works for you. So the information is out there. Google's your best friend, um, but you can also, you know, visit my site if you want more information on that as well. And your site is? It's CassandraDason.com and um, my Twitter and Instagram handles are at CassandraDason. Excellent. I'll make sure and put those in the show notes so that everyone has them. Cassandra Dason, thank you so much for this amazing conversation today. I feel like we covered 50 industries and 40 different <laughs> jobs and solved you know, so many of the world's problems. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, we, we, we got to the tip of the iceberg, but I really appreciated the time. And I hope this is helpful for any of your listeners. Oh, I hope so too. Thank you. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.